Good evening, everyone. This is Al Fadi. Thank you again for being with us in another episode of this fascinating series about the Qiraat uh, of the Quran. And uh, today is going to be really fascinating. Uh, we, the title itself uh, said it all. It's the 1924 Hafs Canonized Quran. Hopefully, you're paying attention to the date, 1924. And of course, with me here to unpack all of this is Dr. Jay Smith. Jay, welcome back. What's this 1924? Oh, I want to talk about this because the 1924 is when one text was chosen. Take a look at that pile of Qurans that we have in front of us. These are all different. These are not only readers, but they're also narrators. Uh, the two at the top here, Galun and Warsh. Uh, and then right above it on the very top is the blue one. The blue one is actually the most important of all those. It's the smallest one. Isn't that symbolically significant? It is the most significant one, supposedly from what all the Muslims are telling us today. But I put it up there as a very small one because it actually is the least significant. Now, we need to prove our point. So right. that's what we're going to do now. We're gonna, should they have chosen that little blue one? No, they shouldn't have. They should have actually chosen the one below it. Or they should have chosen this one down here. But this one down here is actually the most important. Or Ibn Amr. Ibn, you know. No, Ibn Kathir. Ibn Kathir from Mecca, of from course. Mecca. They should have chosen him. Right. Or at least the Warsh. But no, they chose this. So what we want to do is I want to go back. Let's go to the slide now. And let's look at the, there it is, the Kirat Kanandrum. This is what we're calling this. And you can see, you've all seen this before if you've been following our series. Remember the 10 readers? Those are the 10 readers, the green seven and the red three. Uh, they were introduced about, well, in the 8th century, starting with 736 up until 844, the mid 9th century. And then you have the purple 12 Narrators, I'm sorry, did I say 12? 20 narrators, uh, all in purple there. I put them smaller because they are less uh, important. And the one I really want to show you is the Huffs there. There I've now got him circled in black, uh, the Huffs that you have there. So was he a good choice? Was he a good choice? And the answer is no, he was not. Here's why. Now, I have five problems. Let's look through the five problems that I'm going to come up with. First of all, he was not trustworthy and therefore not suitable. Secondly, he was not chosen for textual veracity or authenticity, but for political reasons. Thirdly, he came from the wrong city. Fourthly, he came from the wrong dialect. And then fifthly, he should have been the last person among the 30 to have been chosen. Why? Well, let's before we even get into him, I want to talk about his stable, her, the man that from which his stable came from. So let's we'll put the slide back up there again. I want to talk about Asim. He is the one that is the reader. He is the one who the stable that Huffs came from. And what we know about uh, um, Asim is that we are told that he received his Quran from Zar bin Hubaish and Abu Abd al Rahman al Sulami and also Abu Amr al Shaibani, who supposedly received it from Ali uh, ibn Abi Talib, who is the fourth caliph, and from Masud Kufa. Do you know of any of those? Have you seen any of their Qurans? You don't. Do any of them exist today? Of course not. So this is nothing more than hearsay. This is nothing more than attribution. We don't know if any of these came or any of these even existed. I mean, we know of Ali of uh, Abi Talib. That's about it. You know, but do we have his Quran? Uh, we have what is attributed to him. And where are they? Uh, it's just available. You can buy it. Uh, Actually, sometime. no, they're supposedly in India, of all places. What are they doing in India? Yeah. In Uttar I mean, Pradesh. The, the original one, yes, uh, of course. That's and you know they have seven of them? Yeah. Of course, seven of them? Yeah. Has anybody done any forensic testing on them? Has anybody done any textual uh, forensic testing or even dated them? No. I, I wonder, I mean, this is a serious question. I wonder if we can uh, focus now on some of the Shia efforts uh, to, because the Shia have a problem with the Sunni Qurans, by the way, as yeah. you know. Not for this episode, but for another right. time. I we'll mean, bring that hopefully up. Hopefully we can uh, come across uh, some information about Ali ibn Abi Talib, of course. Okay. So yeah. let's go back to uh, let's go back to Asim and let's see what others said about him. Look at what Ibn Asad said. He says Asim was reliable but made mistakes in his transmission. Abd Allah ibn Ahmad said Al Amash memorized the tradition much more correctly. So he was even better than than uh, Asim. You, if you want to Yaqub, give the names, Yaqub ibn Sufyan. His transmission of the tradition contains some confusion. Uh, ibn uh, Ulayya. Everyone named Asim was faulty in memorization and attrition. Uh, ibn um, Kharash. His transmission of the tradition contains some deniable things. Uh, Al Uqayli. He had no problem with Asim except poor memorization of the tradition. Al Daraq. 
Darakutni, uh, I mean, uh, sometimes when you see an Arabic uh, trans, uh, you know, when they transliterate it, it's, they butcher it. Okay, and Asim had yeah. fault of memory. We're getting that over and over again. Yeah. It looks like they did not like his memory. So you can see that the stable leader, the one who is in, uh, import, the one who is in charge of uh, from White House, and we have one more that I just want to go to, and that's Hamad uh, ibn Salman, who said Asim became confused towards the end of his life. So not really ra sounding a, a resounding support for this guy named Afsa, right? Awesome, that's right. But let's go back to Hafs. What about Hafs? What do we know about Hafs? Well, we know that Hafs was, uh, name was, if you want to read it there. Uh, Hafs ibn Sulaiman al-Asadi. And look at the place he came from. From Kufa in uh, modern day Iraq. He was raised by, raised by Asim, so he, at least he did know Asim. Unlike many of the other narrators, they didn't even know who their stable leader was. He himself said that he did not depart from Asim's reading except in one word, and that's in Surah Al-Rum, Surah 3. So, verse 54, if that's the case, why are we even going to Hafs then? Mm -hmm. Why in the world are we wasting time with Hafs? Why don't we just go to Asim? Why did he depart from his own teacher? Well, that's... Did he doubt his own teacher? But only in one case. Isn't mm -hmm. that fascinating? So How why, do we know it's one case only? Well, that's why no one has done a study between Asim and Hafs. We have both Asim and Hafs, and that's what we're doing now. Okay, let's think about it for a second. If you're telling me I'm your student, and you are supposedly the guy who maybe heard it from someone who heard it from Muhammad, there is maybe one between you and Muhammad, and I'm doubting one verse from you, what does that say about all of your reading? Well, therefore, uh, why did you keep to the stable? What are you even doing in that family? Exactly. Should you not have just written what he ever, whatever That's he right. said? Exactly. But is this even the case that he only disagreed in one? That's true. That's another thing. That uh, can they prove that? They have not proved that. We're going to be doing that, but not not in these episodes. That's yet to be done. What else do we know? Well, I'll, we have uh, Al Dhabi says this. Hafs was reliable in his reading, consistent and accurate, but not so in the transmission of his tradition. Uh oh, that's not too good. Who's this guy? Uh, Ibn Abi Hatim. His, that's Huff's transmission of the tradition, was rejected. Why? Uthman Darimi. Because he was not reliable. And not just him, others said much the same thing. So mm. for, you, you, you're starting to see that there is a recurring thread here. Right. Uh, Ibn al-Madini. Huss was weak in the tradition, and I intentionally avoided transmitting from him because he was Intentionally. <laughs> Al-Buhari, our famous Al-Buhari from died yeah. in 870. Look and see what he says. He was rejected by the compilers of biographical dictionaries. And then Al-Nas'ai, I consider him untrustworthy and the traditions he transmitted were not recorded. These are hadith transmitters, by the way, uh, Al-Buhari and Nisa'i. Uh, so if these guys who collected the hadith uh, telling you something like this, who supposedly uh, were able to tell which hadith is sound and which hadith is not sound, why aren't we taking their uh, advice? Why are we even going to Hafs, okay? Yeah. Let's go back because there were, these were not the only ones. There were other ones that also had their opinions and they were not any better. So let's go to al Darakutni. What did he say? He declared him weak. Go ahead, what's his name? Uh, Asaji. Hafs is one of those whose traditions have disappeared. What he transmitted contained objectionable traditions. Uh, Salih ibn Muhammad. His traditions were not recorded, and all of them were objectionable. Uh, ibn, uh, again, Ibn Kharash. He was a liar and was rejected for fabricating traditions. Wow. Woo. Fabricating. Fabricating. So yeah. you can see there, these are not high opinions of Hafs. Ibn Hayyan. He used to change the change of transmission and even fabricated change for those traditions that did not have ones. Now that's a powerful statement right there. We're talking about the chains of transmission that deals with the Qara'at. So if he changed those transmission, doesn't that indicate that as if he's trying to make himself look more authoritative? There you go. Yeah. Well, all the more reason to reject him. So uh, let's go ahead and let's conclude. And what do we have? Well, let's go back to our slide. He was unreliable. He was weak. He was untrustworthy. He was, contained objectionable material, contained fabricated change. His traditions disappeared. He was a liar, his transmission were not recorded by others, and others avoided him, so much so that Abdul Rahman al Mudi declared, I solemnly declare that it is not permissible to transmit traditions on Hafs authority. Now, so the question I ask, 
Why was Hufs therefore with all these problems? Why in the world was he chosen as the official Quran if he was so unreliable and so untrustworthy? The million dollar question, and I want to bring it back home to the Bible. Two guys that get attacked by our Muslims all the time, Luke and the Apostle Paul. Luke, in the opening of his gospel, told you that he himself investigated with eyewitness accounts all the things that are being said. In other words, he's saying, you know what? You don't believe me, go and verify it yourself. Paul, in 1 Corinthians 15, says that the Lord appeared and he began to list. First, he says he, he was risen according to scripture. Then he says he appeared to Cephas. Then he appeared to the apostles, the 11, or, or the 12, technically speaking. Then he appeared to, mentioned James. Then he appeared, he said also he appeared to 500. Then last thing he said he appeared to me. What, what is Paul trying to tell you? Go and verify. And these were all eyewitnesses verifications. Exactly. These are not so-and-so attributed to so-and-so, attributed to so-and-so hundreds of years later. And these guys that you listed are being honest enough to tell you, warning, Time out. Don't use this guy. And they're right. Look how many other guys you could use. <laughs> you could have used a lot better. You could have done a yeah. lot better. You got the wrong guy is what they're all saying. So what do, you, what do you think was the reason for sticking with Huffs? Is it the political status? Is it a prestige? Is it wealth? From what we're finding out, and this is going to be in the next segment that we're going to be going to, we know the Ottomans chose Huffs because he was the easiest to understand. He was one of the most simple to understand. Why did Ibn Mujahid, Ibn Mujahid never gave a criteria as to why he chose Hafs. We do know that he is the earliest of all the narrators, died in 796. That could have something to do with it and the fact that he also lived with Asim, the fact that he was there with Asim, whereas so many other the narrators that always came so much time afterwards, they never knew the readers that they were, that they were uh, attributed to, which is rather ironic because even if you do live with them, why, then, 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 why is it that your text is not the same as the one you're living with? That's true. I mean, it's almost like, I, I hate to even bring an example like this, which is totally different. You know, uh, we get attacked by, why do you have the NIV? Why do you have the ESV? Why do you have the message? Why do you have the NLT? They're all based on manuscript evidence you that go. you can go and verify. But here the Ottoman Empire chose Hus because he's easier. <laughs> You know, they, they, we, uh, we're going to get to this, and in conclusion, we're going to come to this. But I think it's fascinating that Tufts was chosen, as we're going to see in the next episode. He was chosen not because he was the best or uh, the, the closest. He was chosen for political reasons and political reasons alone. And I'm not surprised, of course. That's why I'm trying to get to the bottom of why this particular guy, with all the warnings and all the flags that were raised, no one paid attention uh, to his reading. Thank you, Dr. J, as always. Uh, fascinating. Thank you, everyone, for being here with us. Until next episode, have a blessed day. Thank you for watching this video. Be sure to like and subscribe to our channel, Sierra International. Also, click on the bell so that you can receive notifications whenever we publish a new video or we go live. And I would like to appeal to you to consider becoming a Patreon patron by clicking on the link right below. And that way you can give towards the production of these videos. There are also other options for you on how you can give to our channel. So thank you from the bottom of my heart.